So welcome. Thank you for coming out on this um, wet and humid day. We have a wonderful panel here, so I'm going to get started as soon as we can. I'm going to do brief introductions. But the first introduction is by way of saying that each one of these gentlemen has had some experience working for the government. And I think it matters when you're thinking about the balance between security and liberty. And so I will briefly introduce them, and then we can get to our talk. First is James Aaron. I'm sure you know him very well. He has a wonderful news show, which has been going for how many years? Oh, at least 10 years. At least 10 years, and probably many in this room have been on it. Um, and it's just provocative. If you haven't, thoughtful. you're invited to come on in the news. There you go. <laughs> Recently wrote a book called The Mother Court about the Southern District of New York, which is really a wonderful read. I encourage you to read it. And he's been thinking about these issues and talking to everyone in the field for a very long time. Next is uh, Matt Waxman, professor at Columbia University, also a fellow here at the, Center on For uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. He has written innumerable pieces, mostly for lawyers, but also for the public. Um, Matt worked for the Pentagon. He worked for Condoleezza Rice. He worked in the Bush administration when these questions of security versus liberty were in the front of everybody's mind, both in government and in the public, and is one of the best resources in the country for thinking about these issues. And then there is Ken Roth, who I discovered this morning has been at Human Rights Watch <coughs> since 1993, which is, of course, all of our lifetimes. So I don't know how that happened, Ken, that you've been there so long. Ken worked in the Southern District, the court that Jim wrote about, as a prosecutor. And since then, he's been working um, as the head of Human Rights Watch and doing a fabulous job in growing it from what was a very small organization to something that must be, I don't know, 10 times its original size, uh, and is now in countries all over the world. The reports that they produce, both about this country and elsewhere, are the beginning point for so much human rights advocacy and legal work uh, around the world. So I think, um, I think we have a good panel. I'm going to get started with, with a question that's very broad. And then we will get into the uh, smaller questions. And that question is, over the course of the 12-plus uh, years since 9-11, the, uh, since, since the war on terror began, we've been debating security versus liberty. How do we strike this balance? Do we want to strike this balance? The assumption of this panel is we want to strike this balance somehow. And, and I'd like you to comment on that, whether that is actually what we want to do, strike a balance. And then what you think the shape of that balance has been, or that conversation has been, over the past decade to 12 years, in the sense of have we progressed in terms of both security and liberty? Are we on a long, slippery slope away from liberty? Or what, what, how exactly do you see the shape of this story? Jim, we'll start with you. Uh, well, I could uh, start with a conversation I had with uh, a friend of mine named John Sowers when he was uh, ambassador of the United Nations from Britain, and he subsequently became head of MI5. And he made the obvious statement, which hadn't quite occurred to me, that it's for the executive branch to uh, protect our safety, and it's uh, for the judiciary to protect our liberties. And I think that immediately strikes a balance. Now, you get overly zealous members of the executive branch who take, of course, their obligation to ensure our safety very seriously. And the issue arises as to whether that isn't at the expense of our liberties. General Hayden, the CIA, uh, the, who was the head of the CIA, or when he was the head of the CIA, uh, made the statement at the council that he was going to go uh, so close to the line that uh, there would be chalk on his cleats. And uh, when you have an overzealous executive branch uh, exercising its duty, uh, its very serious and solemn duty to protect uh, safety, you uh, often get intrusions. And of course, the intrusions that we've seen since 9-11 are, uh, broadly speaking, are, uh, uh, enhanced interrogation, uh, which may be a euphemism for torture, uh, surveillance, uh, detention uh, without a trial for going on for uh, a decade or more, uh, and um, surveillance which may be warrantless in certain cases, or even if uh, there is a warrant may uh, uh, have a tendency to uh, undermine our civil liberties. So uh, uh, what is the shape of it now? Uh, I think that uh, since we've gone for a period of time without another attack, uh, 
uh, there's less incentive on the part of the executive branch perhaps to uh, uh, encroach on civil liberties, but then you have the further question as to uh, what these civil liberties are and what they should be, and I think my colleagues can address that more uh, precisely. Matt, you've given some thought to the different <coughs> periods of, of um, the different issues that have been uh, under focus during different periods of time since 9-11. Do you want to talk a little bit about that to shape the rest of the discussion? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think if, if you look at the period since 9-11, we've gone through, a, 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 I think, a series of big debates about particular issues of civil liberties and national security. Some of them have been resolved to one degree or another. Some of them, I think, have been totally, uh, uh, r r remain quite unresolved. I think the first, probably the, the biggest uh, uh, debate uh, 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 was, was one uh, uh, in around the 2004, 2005 time period when the major focus was on detainee treatment and especially interrogation issues. This was, uh, I, I think, fueled in part by the Abu Ghraib uh, uh, disclosures. Um, I, I, this was also a period where there was quite a bit of reform, not as much reform as some people in this room might like, but this was a, a, a period where Congress uh, uh, got in the game, um, passed statutes limiting, uh, 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 I imposing certain minimum treatment standards, for example, um, with regard to, to any detainees. But 2004, 2005, I would say the big issue was detainee treatment. Uh, uh, later, uh, uh, after that, for around 2006, 2007, 2008, I think the big issue was uh, uh, one of uh, detainee process. What kind of procedural protections are detainees, captured terrorism suspects, entitled to? And that's one that I think remains quite unresolved. Quite unresolved. There's a lot of. Uh, it, there remains quite a lot of debate. I think there was an expectation that President Obama was going to come in and enact some significant reforms in that area, or that Congress might act. I think uh, we 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 remain uh, um, quite uh, uh, in 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 a state of quite uh, a bit of split on that particular issue. President Obama comes into, into office in 2009. I think the, the big civil liberty question that was getting the most attention then concerned drone strikes and targeting, the use of lethal force, especially lethal force against US citizens, even though uh, uh, that represented such a small percentage of the actual use of lethal force in the war against Al, Al Qaeda. Uh, uh, and then more recently, with the Snowden disclosures, the major issue is surveillance. And there, I think we're starting to see some consensus perhaps some legislative uh, movement on a, a small piece of the surveillance issue. Um, but again, major, major issues uh, remaining, remaining unresolved. Ken, President Obama came in, as, as Matt has said, with a great deal of promise uh, and made a lot of pronouncements about what he was going to change in the areas Matt has laid out. How do you see what he's done and how it's affected the debate in terms of these issues, detention, surveillance, drones, and interrogation? Overall, I mean, I've been disappointed by Obama in large part because he hasn't been willing to spend the political capital to really take on these issues when there's any resistance. So, you know, right at the beginning, he did stop the torture. Um, he, he, you know, definitively closed the CIA secret detention facilities. But he's refused to prosecute anybody for torture. Um, and indeed, he's even fought until recently the disclosure of the Senate Intelligence Committee report, which still um, is not declassified because Obama's CIA is still blocking that. And, and so we're left on the issue of torture with it being a policy choice of Obama not to continue it, but no reaffirmation that this is blatantly illegal and, and a criminal act that should never be replicated. So who knows what comes next? Um, you know, with respect to detention, again, he came into office talking about closing Guantanamo. Uh, he tried to um, bring the 9-11 the suspects to trial here in the Southern District of New York, he caved in the face of pressure from everybody from Bloomberg to, to the right wing in Congress with you know, very unhelpful results in the sense that you know, the military commissions are going on and on and on. And I, I would be surprised if we ever get a conviction under the military commissions. Whereas if people had been brought um, to the Southern District for civilian trials, these would have been long done with, with you know, few qualms about the fairness of the trials. You know, on drones, Obama, I mean, the biggest problem with drones has been what standards govern them. And you know, Obama gave a very good speech a year ago, mm -hmm. basically articulating 
the proper standards. And the, the big question is, you know, are, should these be war standards in which you can just shoot to kill an enemy combatant with very few constraints? Or should they be policing standards where you use lethal force only as a last resort to face an imminent lethal threat? Obama basically endorsed the latter standard, policing standards, in a place like Yemen, where there's no visible armed conflict involving the United States going on. But unfortunately, it was Professor Obama speaking, not President Obama. So he didn't give any order. He just gave a nice speech, and, and practice continues. And on surveillance, you know, Snowden, the supposed traitor, is the one who disclosed all of this. I mean, we would have had no changes had it not been for the Snowden disclosures. Um, we now are scrutinizing much more closely, recognizing that this mass collection of our communications metadata has uh, ended not, you know, or, or solved not a single terrorist case that the administration can cite while massively invading our privacy. Um, there are steps being taken to correct that, but with respect to the separate issue of actually listening in on the communications or reading the emails of non-Americans outside the United States, Obama's not doing anything to address that and indeed is about to lose the ability to set standards to this German-Brazilian initiative, which is going to set international standards despite or without the involvement of the United States because the U.S. has been so far behind on this issue. I'd just like to uh, supplement Ken's arguments, uh, which I essentially agree with in, in one area, and that is uh, the trial of uh, terrorists uh, in uh, civilian courts as opposed to military commissions. Military commissions have historically been unsuccessful. They were uh, called into question because of the trials during the Civil War or after the Lincoln assassination. Uh, there were military commissions in the Second World War. Uh, but. Uh, the Southern District of New York has acquired great expertise in successfully prosecuting terrorists under standards uh, that have existed for 225 years and are well recognized in our jurisprudence. In 1961, in the Southern District, uh, a, uh, a group of Quebec uh, separatists who uh, wanted to blow up the Statue of Liberty and the, and the Liberty Bell and the Washington Monument was successfully prosecuted in the Southern District of New York long before 9-11. Before 9-11, uh, Mary Jo White brought at least uh, six uh, terrorism cases, including attacks on American embassies, attacks on the coal, uh, and, uh, and other cases, uh, all before 9-11, and they were all successfully prosecuted without turning the court into a forum for propaganda or any of the other horribles that uh, the critics of the civilian trials have voiced. Uh, and then most recently we've had uh, two successful prosecutions in the Southern District of New York involving uh, terrorists. Both resulted in a conviction. Uh, the last one was of the uh, propagandist uh, in uh, London who uh, supported uh, uh, the 9-11 uh, attacks and uh, claimed it was all just speech, but it turned out it was much more than speech. And so uh, I would uh, submit that uh, the civilian courts are the proper forum uh, to prosecute terrorists, either 9-11 terrorists or other terrorists if there's jurisdiction here. And uh, that uh, if in the case of Khalil Sheikh Mohammed, the poster child who was being tried in a trial that never seems to begin or to end uh, in uh, Guantanamo, uh, where uh, constitutional safeguards uh, are not observed in all respects, and it's kind of a, a, a makeshift uh, procedure that has been uh, engrafted on military tribunals to try to give him certain rights he'd have in a civilian court, but not quite succeeding. I would submit that that's the wrong way to go. Matt, I want to turn to surveillance and the Snowden revelations and what they've unleashed. Where do you think we stand now? What do you think is going to happen? Well, so Sorry, I don't mean to make you a yeah. prophet, but <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, one of the things that's in, well, well. First of all, I think different people see very different things in the Snowden revelations. Um, I have to say, uh, I, 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 in, in my mind, to, to me, the Snowden revelations showed um, um, uh, uh, quite a lot of areas where, where, in my view, the the government was overreaching on policy grounds. I think it was overreaching on policy grounds, but uh, but I don't look at the Snowden revela revelations and see um, rampant illegality. In fact, quite the contrary. One of the things the the documents show is a national security agency that is obsessed with legal compliance and procedures for ensuring it. Now, one might say that um, the the legal boundaries that were set that it's complying with are too broad, 
that Congress has given uh, 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 the NSA uh, intelligence agencies too much leeway. The uh, uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court has been uh, buying into interpretations of the NSA's authorities that are too broad, and we can we can debate whether that's true. Uh, I, I, I think reasonable people can can, dis can 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 disagree on that. Um, what I don't think the the documents uh, 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 the, the the information shows, though, is a, um, a, 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 a an NSA that is lawless that is abusing its, its powers and, and so forth. And uh, to, to, to come back to a point that was made earlier, I mean, one of the questions is how effective are these programs? And I think that's a very, very important question to ask when we talk about uh, massive collection of uh, telephony metadata, for example. Um, you know, how useful is that as a counterterrorism tool? That's a critically important question to ask, and it's one that's very difficult to answer. It's not one that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court is equipped to answer. It's not one that I think congressional oversight is well equipped to answer. It's, it, it, in terms of setting up the right institutions to analyze these questions, uh, 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 that's difficult. I don't think, though, that the metric we should be, we should be judging these programs by is how many terrorist attacks did this or that program program stop. Uh, I, I, there are a number of people, friends in, in the audience I know who are who work in intelligence, and one of the, uh, I think, most important lessons of the last decade and a half of combating al-Qaeda is that uh, 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 intelligence programs work in combination. You don't thwart terrorist attacks with one intelligence program at a time. Um, so I think it's silly to ask how many terrorist attacks did any one program stop? That's just not a, a good way to, to judge programs. In fact, if, uh, 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 if the number of attacks thwarted by any one program were extremely high, I would wonder why isn't, uh, uh, what, what, what is the rest of the intelligence community doing? Ken, how do you see this? Yeah. Well, for, for real, Matt, I, I, mean, I, I disagree with you in the sense mm. that I think it's a, a bit of a straw man to say, you know, what terrorist attack did this program alone stop? Um, rather, the appropriate question is, but for this program, um, was there any terrorist attack that, that was stopped that wouldn't have been stopped? And the answer to that is no. In other words, this program, the, the vast collection of our metadata, according to the Obama administration, didn't contribute um, to, wasn't a necessary contribution to stopping of any terrorist attack. In fact, the best case they can come up with is this guy in San Diego who, you know, wire transferred money to the Al-Shabaab. You know, a classic case of targeted surveillance. I mean, they have to be out of their mind not to be, you know, already tracing Al-Shabaab's bank accounts. And so, you know, why, why do you need this mass collection of metadata in order to get there? They can't come up with a single case. In which case you have to say, well, why was this mass intrusion on our privacy worth it. Now, I mean, you're right in the sense that that particular part of the program wasn't illegal. It goes back to a, a 1979 Supreme Court case where the court ruled that, um, you know, when you dialed a phone number, this is back in the days when you did that, you dialed, um, that, that you had no privacy interest in those numbers because you shared them with the phone company. Now, you know, it easily could have decided that case the other way around, um, but that rationale is no longer, I would argue, an appropriate one in a world where our metadata really you know, defines our lives in many ways more than the contents of our communications. And the, the Supreme Court has actually hinted in the Jones case of two years ago that it was not happy, five justices were not happy with um, this rote application of, of this 1979 case to our mass communications metadata today and essentially gave the Obama administration a chance to fix it up before the court ruled. And indeed, it is now doing that. It's, it's pulling out of the mass collection of metadata. But one example where I think you know, um, the NSA went way beyond any legitimate interpretation of law and the FISA court went along is this argument that when the government collects our metadata, that that doesn't involve our privacy rights at all until it looks at it. Um, that is, if it's just sitting in a government computer, we don't have to worry about it in privacy terms. And, and you know, I mean, the analogy I've been using, which I think you know, puts this in the appropriate light, is imagine if the government you know, put a video camera in your bedroom with a direct feed into a government computer and said, don't worry, you know, your privacy rights interests are not implicated on, unless we actually look at the video. You know, would you be satisfied with that? Would that be adequate protection of your privacy interests? Obviously not. 
But that has been the theory. It was such an untenable theory that they never went public with it. You know, the FISA court was the only one that ever ruled on it secretly, and we didn't know about it until Snowden. Once we know about it, Obama immediately backs off, and, and the new legislative proposals won't do that anymore. The, the phone companies and the internet companies keep the data until there's a focused query for it. But that's an example of how, you know, when you have a system that is not being publicly scrutinized, you get the wrong balance between privacy rights and, and our security. But does it make any difference in your view if the data is lodged with the government or it's lodged with the phone company when the government can obtain it anytime it wants to by subpoena or uh, otherwise? Well, yes, it does in the sense that, I mean, first of all, as long as there's not a mandate on the phone company to, to or the internet company to keep the data beyond what is useful for business purposes. Um, but it, the big difference is that if the government has to ask for it with a targeted request, that's a big protection. None of us objects to targeted surveillance. Um, you have to make an evidentiary showing to an independent tribunal or somebody, and then a warrant is issued that says you can get this or that set of you know, phone calls or, or, or emails. But the, the problem is that the US government has been collecting all of our data on the theory that you need a haystack to find the needle. And, and that you know, very elastic sense of relevance has given really almost no um, recognition to our privacy rights. Matt, I, you want to weigh in? On yeah, that? well, so, so I, I'd make a couple of points on, on that and in, in response to some of the, 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 the points that Ken made, some of which I, I very much agree with, um, though, though I'd push back on, on, on a couple of aspects. First of all, you know, I, I, I do think it's, it's a bit odd that there's this, um, uh, uh, that, that the fix to the problem of government collection and analysis of our metadata is um, let's leave it in the hands of companies uh, uh, and just make sure that when the government wants to do some targeted query, it'll go to those companies and, and get the data. The reality is that in the 21st century, there's massive amounts of data that all of us are generating, digital crumbs that are being collected by various uh, 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 actors, government, private sector, et cetera. And just based on what I've seen of what the government does with that data and what the private sector does, I have more faith that the government is respecting my privacy than the private sector. I, I, that's, that's, in terms of my comfort level, I'm more comfortable with it in the hands of the government than companies that I, I admittedly willingly give it to because of, because of, uh, of, of convenience. I also, I mean, I, I share um, I, 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 Ken's uh, uh, concerns about the, the metadata program. And uh, I, I, I agree that I have not seen a persuasive case about how effective this program has been in thwarting attacks. Mm -hmm. The question being sort of, but for this program, would some a, a, attacks have, have occurred? Uh, I, I, and I think that's an important question to ask. Though, I mean, part of this, I, I think the difficulty here is as we think about this uh, 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 prospectively, um, which programs, which kinds of protections are we willing to dispose of? And then what is going to be our reaction when a terrorist attack gets through? I, 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 I'm hesitant to make big public predictions, but I'll do one now and it's a, it's a dire one, which is I think sometime in the next decade, we're going to have a major public debate about some catastrophe. I think it's going to be something nasty involving, for example, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, synthetic biological agents. And one of the questions we're going to be asking, and we're going to be, we're going to be beating the government up over this, is why weren't you collecting and analyzing more data about individuals who were accessing certain kinds of, 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 of biological agents, for example? This could have been avoided if we'd collected and analyzed uh, 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 information more smartly. Now, the answer isn't th then, you know, swing in the, you know, b back in the direction of, well, just collect and analyze everything. Not only would that be a problem for civil liberties, but it would also be a problem for security. We can't do it, and choices have to be made. Uh, but I do think there are some difficult judgments uh, that do have to be made about what kinds of reasonable infringements of privacy we're willing to make 
uh, uh, in order to buy certain uh, uh, additional protections in, 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 uh, 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 in security. And right now, I mean, one of the things that I'm struck by as I look at the Snowden revelations and what's coming of them is the, the reaction of our political system is not, wow, we need to radically reform our surveillance program. There, there, it, it is likely that Congress is going to pass some uh, 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 new protections with regard to metadata. It'll, it'll be in the hands of the private telephone companies and the government will have to uh, 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 query it in, in certain more specific ways. Um, uh, 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 but the reaction has not been, holy cow, I didn't realize the government was doing all of these kinds of things, so let's scrap it. Uh, I, I think we're going to end up, I think the political system is going to end up in a place not that different than uh, surveillance looked before the Snowden revelation. I, I'm not sure that's true. In other words, what, what, if you just look at the House mm -hmm. bill right now, it, there's a, for, for metadata, not mm -hmm. for you know, non-Americans outside the United States, but for metadata, there's a big shift because they're basically saying that this, this analysis that um, the NSA was playing with, which is you know, collect all of our data and then mm -hmm. do a big data analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, this new tool that's only been possible for the last three or four years. Um, there basically is a, a decision that no, that's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. That the infringement on our, all of our privacy rights by collecting that data in order to permit a big data analysis yeah. isn't worth it. And instead we're going to go back to the traditional method, which is targeted surveillance. Now, in, in the, the example you give, I mean, if there is a you know, particular lab or particular tools needed to make some kind of synthetic biological agent, by all means, they should be surveilling them. You know, nobody would quarrel with that. And look at the people who are, who are checking in on that, look at the people they're talking to. That's classic targeted surveillance. What we object to is to pick up all of our metadata and, and you know, plug in who's talking about biological weapons. Because you know, there are lots of very legitimate reasons to talk about biological weapons. I do it. You know, um, does that mean that I'm a legitimate subject? You know, and that's what people are objecting to. But I, I think where you and I disagree, though, is I'm not as bothered by you, a, 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 as you are by the by, by the collection and warehousing by the government because I, I do I do think that there is and there have been in the past grounds for grave concern about abuse of what the government does with that data. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and the answer to that is not for the government not to collect and analyze data. It's to put in place good checks and, and protections to ensure that the, that, the, that the government is a good steward of that information and doesn't abuse it. And I, I mean, I think the, I think the Snowden uh, uh, documents, that, the documents that have come out through Snowden, show that the government has actually been quite responsible with what it does with that data. No, but but, but what, are the, what are the checks on Google and AOL? If that's, if that's where it's lodged. That's where I'd like to see more checks. I mean, is your, is, yeah. your, is your privacy invaded if uh, Google then uses the information to uh, market uh, some product to you that you don't want, or to, uh, or if you buy a book on Amazon, pretty soon yeah. uh, the, the, they want you to have a massage. I, I mean, that's. I, I want to bring this back to the, the the national security and the government because one of the things that's underlying mm -hmm. Matt's premise is trusting the government mm -hmm. and trusting who's in power. They have all this information, but they'll only look at it in the following. Mm -hmm. is, is that something all of you are comfortable with? No, I, there, I traditionally there are two checks on government. I mean, one is what, you're, Matt, you're describing, that if it has information, it can only do certain things with it. But there's a separate check in terms of what information it can collect, particularly on the means they can use to collect that information. And I'm not satisfied with dispensing on those restraints on the means of collection and simply focusing on use. In answer to the, the, both of your questions about, you know, what about private companies? I mean, um, in Europe, you know, the, the concept of data protection that you, you know, actually own the information about you, whether it's in the government's hands or or private industry's hands, that is going to be something that Americans are going to have to deal with more and more as the world becomes more globalized. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to pretend that what Google does or Facebook does is, is completely fine, but it is different in, in kind from what the government can do. I mean, while, while Google or Facebook can cause a lot of embarrassment, they can market you things you don't want to be marketed, they can share your data, they're not able to put you in prison, they're not able to do a lot of course of things that are uniquely governmental. And that's why I think the concept of rights as a constraint on governmental conduct is different and important from the separate need to regulate companies that have vast amounts of our private data commercially. Ken, you said that it, earlier that you thought that they ha w uh, <coughs> that this new legislation rolls back to a time of targeted um, surveillance. Rolls on, back on to what? On right? metadata. On metadata. Yeah. Rolls back to before the Patriot Act, before 9-11. I mean, how, where do you see this rolling us back to? 
Well, I mean, it's obviously it's a somewhat different era in that you know the kind of the internet questions that are being asked now are different from the phone questions that were being asked yeah. back when these things were litigated you know 30 years ago. Um, but you know what they seem to be moving toward is um, you know some requirement of factual specificity before you know what about this is suspicious activity that would warrant reading you know looking at the getting access to the metadata, um, some kind of independent arbiter. And some kind of limit on how many hops out you can go. And that there, you know, it used to be three hops, and now it's two hops. Um, so that means, you know, if, if you happen to, you know, call a pharmacy and the pharmacist has a, a shady connection, that doesn't mean, you know, you s or suddenly become a suspect if you're three hops away the way it used to. But in, in that sense, it, you know, it, it's more like the paradigm of a search warrant or a classic wiretap. And I think that's the direction that we should be going. You know, the big restriction is that it doesn't yet apply those constraints for non-Americans outside of the United States, which implicates many U.S. citizens as well, because, you know, we all live in a global world. And I mean, I spend more than half my time talking to people outside the United States, you know, the vast majority of whom are non-Americans. So I'm getting picked up all the time, as I suspect are many of you. And, um, you know, that's incidental to their listening in on, on a, a foreign target. So I think we... You know, we have to worry about it in those terms. We have to worry about it that whatever precedent the United States sets is exactly what other governments are going to do, which is going to scoop up all of our communications. If they're all part of the five eyes, you know, the U.S., mm -hmm. U.K., Canada, New Zealand, Australia, they're just going to trade stuff. So if the U.S. can't listen in on your conversation, Britain can, and then they'll just trade it back and forth. So there's a lot more still to be done. This, this <coughs> house bill is a, a narrow, partial solution to the problem. So in a way, the courts, the way you referred to, because the trials are basically, these are legacy trials at Guantanamo, and the rest are, it seems, a, a signal from the administration are going through the federal courts, whether it's EDVA or the Southern District of New York. Um, in surveillance, there's some kind of new rationa rationality for um, pushing back on the overzealousness of the government. What about drones? Is that the outlier in this, in terms of taking on a life of its own? And where does that, how do you see drones both politically and legally? And this is, let's start with you, Jeff. Well, do we need a, a drone court, uh, so that uh, a secret court like FISA, where the uh, officers of uh, the uh, uh, security forces come in and present their case as to why they uh, uh, should be taking out someone in Yemen? in the desert, and uh, then do you need uh, present, uh, so it's not entirely a lawyer's called an ex-party proceeding with only one party being present, do we need some kind of ombudsman, an advocate uh, for the life of uh, suspected terrorists to appear before the drone court, and then finally a, a, a principal decision is made and uh, they either sign the death warrant or they refuse to sign the death warrant, uh, or are these judgments that really have to be made uh, by the executive branch at a very high level with some kind of uh, uh, check and balance to uh, make sure it's not used arbitrarily and with some sort of standards within the executive branch as to uh, when it can be used. I mean, certainly uh, the cop on the beat has uh, the right under certain circumstances to kill in his own defense or the defense of others. Uh, and if in some far-flung country uh, plotters are... Uh, are trying to accomplish an imminent attack on the United States and they all meet in the House and to uh, do the final uh, uh, details for how the plot is to be carried out, aren't they legitimate targets of a drone attack? Before you guys answer, we're going to go to members' questions in a minute, but I want brief answers from you. And basically on this point, is it, does it matter if we're at peace or at war in terms of having the drone policy that we now have? Matt and Ken, quick. Um, I think, yes, it, it does matter. Um, and I think w w how one evaluates the legality and propriety of drone strikes depends a lot on whether one buys into the basic premise that we're engaged in a war, an armed conflict with Al Qaeda and its allies. And I think if you buy into that, and, and, and let me say I do, and I think all three branches of the US government across administrations, across political parties have bought into that. And I think from that flows authority to use lethal force against enemy fighters under certain circumstances. Now, the big question is under exactly what are those circumstances, especially when we're talking about the use of force outside of a so-called hot battlefield. It's one thing to say, you know, in combat in, in, in Afghanistan, 
uh, 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 leave of force is, is, uh, is, is legal and appropriate, but in Yemen, Somalia, et cetera, it's, uh, it's another story. But I do think a lot depends on the basic framework that one accepts or doesn't that we're engaged in a, in a continuing armed conflict or war or not. Right. Ken, continuing armed mm, conflict? Well, I agree with Matt's statement of the problem. I think we come out differently on, on how we characterize what's going on. Um, the, this has been an easier problem so far because there's been a genuine armed conflict in Afghanistan and in the tribal areas of Pakistan. And so most people, when they think about the global war with al-Qaeda, think about that area. There is a hot war. Nobody's contesting that. But that's obviously winding down in terms of US involvement. And so the real question is, you know, look at Yemen today, which is, I think presents the harder problem. Um, Yemen, you know, there's an occasional drone attack by the United States, but in no realistic sense is the United States engaged in an armed conflict um, with Al Qaeda in, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and I don't mean that in a subjective sense. I don't mean this because Congress said it or didn't say it, but it, there's an objective test under the Geneva Conventions. Is there an adequate level of, of fighting? You know, are there organized forces involved? Um, and under you know, those objective standards, there's not an armed conflict taking place there, which means that the much more restrictive rules governing police powers, you know, that you can only shoot if there's an imminent lethal threat posed to yourself or others, those would kick in. And for the most part, those standards are not met. Um, most people, when asked this question, say, well, Congress has signed off on this global war against terrorism. That's not good enough. Um, I mean, if Congress signed off and said, we are going to go to war with the members of the Council on Foreign Relations, because we all know that sinister plots are hatched there. Um, that wouldn't make it all right for them to start summarily shooting all of us because there's no, you know, th th there's no actual war going on. Um, instead, they have to rely on police standards when they can't shoot unless there's an imminent lethal threat. Um, the same rules should apply in Yemen or, or wherever else this comes up. Absent that objective armed conflict, the only appropriate use of lethal force is under the same standards that applies to the cop on the beat. If there's an imminent lethal threat, yes. Otherwise, you've got to use other means. Your question. Oh, way in the back. Wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself. My name's Gary Sick, Columbia University. Um, I wondered to all of you whether, and all of this discussion has been about us, uh, do the rules only apply to us? I mean, are we really comfortable with the fact that Kazakhstan can operate according to the same rules? Constitutional law, or as a matter of, of, of kind of hard moral or ethical principle, I think they're I, I think they're sound as, uh, as 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 a matter of of, of policy. Um, the, the second, sorry, sir, the second part of your question. Pfizer reform. Oh, Pfizer reform. reform. Um, so, so one of the reforms that's talked about for reform of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court uh, that I think makes quite a a, a lot of good sense is this idea that, especially when the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISC, uh, 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 is deciding major issues of policy or, 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 or legal interpretation, statutory in, or constitutional interpretation, that it's important that there be some representation for uh, 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 the other side of the argument than simply the government's representation. Uh, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance in 1978 for a very specific set of purposes, uh, which were really about tar the kind of targeted surveillance that Ken was talking about. And I think it's a, it's a system that, that does that much better than it's given credit for. Uh, more recently, though, the, the, the FISC has been charged with deciding major public policy issues through interpretation of congressional statutes in secret. And I think that's a dangerous role for that court to play unless, it's, it's, unless we have some real adversarial process. So one of the reforms would be to ensure that outside groups, non-governmental groups, could make arguments, could present arguments, contrary interpretations, uh, uh, for example, before the court. I think that's a sensible reform. Ken, what about the appointment to the FISA court and how it's constituted? I mean, if you're going to have a court that sort of rolls over and makes these policy decisions in cahoots with the government, just to yeah. put it well, well. I would like to find a system where someone other than just the Chief Justice appoints the FISA court members, since um, there's been a sort of one-dimensional nature to those appointments. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with the the, you know, the proposal that is um, before the House now would not only introduce these you know, sort of uh, amicus um, independent you know, experts who would make sure the court's informed by some perspective other than the government, but it would also presumptively declassify 
any FISA court opinion in this policy area, which is important. I would question whether the FISA court even should be making these policy decisions. And I'd be inclined to push them back to the original purpose, which is you know, targeted surveillance, where you can't notify the, the, the subject of that surveillance. It's not clear to me why um, any of these methods are so secret, why without some you know, redaction, you couldn't have a regular Article III court addressing them. Right, um, like you deal with SEPA issues and... and Yes, exactly. There, I mean, there are lots of ways to handle this. I, on, the, on the question of Snowden, by the way, I would just, I mean, I, I think that, you know, unlike, for example, the WikiLeaks dump, where it was just, you know, pretty much indiscriminate, here there seems to have been a, um, you know, fairly focused effort to um, responsibly disclose information that is deeply troubling about the, the way in which our privacy rights were being um, disrespected. And so, you know, while he, as a technical matter, did violate the law, he had a duty not to disclose. Um, I would call him a whistleblower. Um, there is not whistleblower protection in the, under U.S. law for people who have classified information. They have no recourse other than to go to the inspector general of their agency or to the, the congressional intelligence committees. Um, we saw from predecessors to Snowden that those methods didn't work. In fact, they were prosecuted, they were persecuted. Um, so I think Snowden was perfectly fair in recognizing that the established avenues wouldn't work public disclosure was the only option. I think he did us all a service, and I would um, recognize that by having Obama or Holder um, say that they're not going to prosecute him. Jim, you want to weigh in on Snowden? Well, uh, as to what I hope happens to him, uh, I suppose one possibility is that uh, Putin will put some rice in, in his vodka, and then the whole thing will go away. Uh, as a lawyer, I hope that he'll be uh, uh, at some point brought to justice, and. Uh, that uh, because he did violate the law and he uh, uh, did uh, violate his duty and trust, it's hard for me to see him as a whistleblower uh, because uh, he didn't expose any illegality. A whistleblower uh, classically uh, uh, is someone who comes forward and says, well, uh, they're trying to make some product, but they're poisoning everybody's soup. And uh, uh, he hadn't done that. What he's done is he disclosed uh, in terms of the metadata, he uh, disclosed a, a comprehensive uh, program of uh, a spying on, uh, on citizens. And, uh, but done, uh, he certainly hasn't disclosed, to my knowledge, of any instances of warrantless uh, uh, surveillance. Uh, they were all in accordance with uh, the uh, NSA program, which implicates the, the FISA court. So, uh, I think that I don't see him as a whistleblower. I see him as a wrongdoer, uh, and uh, uh, really the hope is that he'll be brought to justice. More questions? Although I do agree with Ken, I think what he did was in the public interest. In the back. With respect to recent developments, uh, in the in New York Times talked about over the weekend Facebook, Google, um, Yahoo, everybody's sort of making some fairly significant changes to um, transmission protocols to subvert efforts to, um, uh, to, sur to, to, to subvert surveillance efforts. Um, also with Brazil and Germany and some other countries basically make, taking their own steps to um, avoid this. Is, are we in a new era now where this is actually moving in the direction of not being possible or is it just becoming much more difficult? Well, no, I mean, look, what, what, what Google, et cetera, are doing is making it difficult to have surreptitious surveillance. You can still have targeted surveillance. You can go get a court order, and, and, and Google will have to turn it over. Well, you know, the surreptitious, the mass surveillance, we don't want. You know, we want to have targeted surveillance where there's a legitimate reason that the government has to articulate before some kind of independent magistrate before they can get your information. Um, if, if Google has to encrypt in order to force the government to follow those rules, so much the better. Now, there's this, it, internationally, I mean, there is a, um, there are a couple different sort of strains of response to this. And I actually, I met with Angela Merkel a couple months ago to discuss this. And, you know, one of the developments that I'm worried about is that there was an effort to create a so-called um, kind of Euro net. And the idea would be that all data about Europeans would have to stay in Europe. And, that you know, would be one response to the NSA surveillance. Um, the alternative response would be to develop global privacy standards that everybody would have to respect. And the problem I see with the Euronet, which I talked to her about and she actually hadn't thought about previously, which was a little scary, but um, when we talk to internet companies about how to operate in China, rule number one is you don't put any user data in China. 
so that when they ask for it, you know, who was that dissident who was talking about Tiananmen Square, you can say, sorry, the data's not here. I can't turn it over to you. Um, if Europe sets up a Euronet, China's going to love it. You know, it's just it's an invitation for them to set up a China net and to force all that user data to be kept in China. And so again, you got to be careful about the precedents you set. And and you know, fortunately, I mean, I you know, I, she got this, and I think they're going to push much more toward establishing global privacy standards rather than setting up this you know sort of technical um, response to it. But there are you know there are many ways that this can all go. We want to do the same thing as the NSA. In other words, we want um, so that we see that you guys are listening to everything. Now we want to listen to everything. We want to be able to get the information the way the American government yeah. can get the information. Yeah. Well, and, and there again, you—I mean, you know—some foreign governments have perfectly legitimate interests in getting that data. I mean, if, if they can articulate, um, you know, a genuine security reason, um, identify a, a, a suspect, you know, by all means they should get it. What I think we want to resist is governments that say, oh, our national security interest is met by somebody who's talking about Tiananmen Square, therefore we can go after them. And you do have to have you know, certain free speech standards welded on to the concept of what national security is. Granted, but I think one of the problems is that it's the companies that are under pressure, not the US government under pressure to yield this information. So, I mean, China being a classic example where, of course, the Chinese are constantly trying to get the internet companies mm -hmm. to yield information about people that they consider to be suspicious or just metadata in general, not to mention you know, countries like you know, Russia or you know, um, you know, North Korea, for goodness sake, or Syria or whatever. I mean, more repressive no, this regimes. Is, this is why um, it's important that as global standards are developed, and we have to recognize that global privacy standards are underdeveloped so far, there's a need to address privacy and free expression at the same time. Now, you know, this is where the US government is actually on the right side. Um, you know, Germany and Brazil, when the U.S. starts talking about free expression, they say, oh, you're just changing the subject. We've got to focus on privacy. In fact, you've got to focus on both. Um, we need, you know, privacy restrictions that make it harder for governments to get our data, but we also need free expression restrictions that limit the kind of data that's appropriately asked for. You need both. Before we um, get to the end of this, I want to make sure we touch on Bergdahl and the prisoner swap, because how could we not? And so I'd like you to each, we're going to start with you, Jim, sort of set this and how you see this, why it's important, maybe it isn't important, but it seems to intersect with an awful lot of the issues we're talking about today. How do you see this? Do you see this in the context of Guantanamo? Do you see this in the context of uh, the end of the war in Afghanistan? Where do you see it? Well, I think the first question needs to be asked are what are the facts? And uh, they remain murky. Was uh, Bergdahl uh, a, uh, a soldier who was uh, uh, captured and detained, or was he a spy? Uh, was he a deserter? Uh, and I think a lot is going to turn on exactly what uh, what happened and what his status was. And I gather he's still being debriefed. And uh, and I think the president may have acted precipitously in receiving his parents at the White House before knowing uh, what the facts were. Uh, secondly, I think you have to uh, draw a distinction uh, between a hostage, a prisoner of war, a uh, detainee, and, uh, uh, wh and whether we uh, negotiate with foreign countries that uh, have taken hostages or taken prisoners of war and are prepared to release uh, people from Guantanamo or elsewhere who are being detained here in exchange. So on the issue of whether he was a deserter or not, do you think that impacts on the decision of whether or not the United States should have brought him home? Well, the decision's been made, and uh, we, uh, uh, Secretary Kerry said uh, he was a U.S. soldier, and of course we want him brought home. And, uh, but of course, if he was a U.S. spy, we have another reason for bringing him home. And uh, we uh, probably, uh, the four uh, people released from, uh, uh, from Guantanamo are uh, not very dangerous, and uh, we really haven't given up very much. With them. You know, we've lost something in terms of our willingness to negotiate uh, for the return of hostages and whom we're willing to give up in return, uh, that remains an open question. Matt, you've been in the Guantanamo detainee release business for, or you were, for yeah. a very long time. Over 500 went out of the Bush administration under a variety of conditions and negotiations. 
What do you think? Yeah, well, so, so one of the things I worked on in the government was the transfer and release decisions of Guantanamo detainees. They're difficult decisions to make. They're, they're, they're difficult, uh, uh, they involve difficult judgment calls about risk, um, and they also uh, uh, involve difficult diplomatic negotiations. One of the things that I worry about uh, uh, coming out of the Bergdahl situation is that the controversy surrounding it may lead to um, uh, uh, greater congressional restrictions, uh, or, or either either uh, 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 as a matter of formal legislation, or just uh, 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 I think um, uh, uh, political pressure uh, uh, on the administration with regard to the transfer and release of Guantanamo detainees. I think that's a mistake. I think whatever one thinks about this particular deal. Uh, I think it's important that the President of the United States have discretion to release and transfer detainees from Guantanamo. I think the kinds of restrictions that Congress has put in place uh, 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 with regard to transferring detainees to third countries or home countries are a mistake. I think a bigger mistake is the restrictions that Congress has put on moving Guantanamo detainees into the United States for possible prosecution in civilian courts. I don't think that's the answer for all of the Guantanamo detainees or even all of the most dangerous ones. I think that is an important tool that any president of any party ought to have, uh, 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 and it's one that the Bush administration would have fought very, very hard for had Congress tried to impose these kinds of restrictions or tried to scrutinize uh, 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 delicate uh, uh, transfer decisions uh, 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 like is uh, 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 occurring now. So th that's that's one of my real worries is that there will be uh, is is that the political reaction to this will make it more difficult for the administration to try to find solutions to uh, uh, many of the remaining Guantanamo cases. Ken, is this the beginning of the end of Guantanamo? <laughs> I wish. Mm -hmm. uh, now look, when you, when you think about Guantanamo, it's useful to think in terms of three categories of detainees. Um, you know, first, they're ones who um, committed, you know, allegedly a serious criminal act, and the administration would like to prosecute. Um, the problem is they've been pursuing them before military commissions, which will never conclude. Um, they actually are set up to fail in many respects, because even if you get to trial, some of the easiest crimes to convict, whether conspiracy or, or material support for terrorism, are not applicable in a military commission. You need to bring them to a civilian court. Um, there are all kinds of problems of fairness. So I hope that for those people, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed foremost, they're brought to the United States for civilian trial. Um, then there is you know, roughly half, if not more, whom the administration, Bush and Obama, have agreed don't pose a threat. And they're just looking for the right moment to send them off. Most of these are Yemenis. Mm -hmm. this, the perception is that you know, Yemen is too chaotic, so there's a reluctance to send them back. But at some point, they've just got to bite the bullet. These people don't pose a serious threat. They should be released. Then the tough issue is about 30 detainees whom Obama says can't be prosecuted because of torture or lack of evidence, but there's a sense that they do pose a serious risk. Mm -hmm. And what do you do about those? His inclination is to move them to some super maximum security facility in the United States, which is just you know, onshore in Guantanamo. In my view, that wouldn't solve anything. Um, rather, you know, I would just release them. I mean, there are lots of dangerous people in the world a handful happen to be in Guantanamo, most are not. Um, why is Obama not going to release this handful? It's the Willie Horton problem. You know, he doesn't want to be politically responsible if one of these does something untoward, um, whereas he wouldn't be politically responsible if one of the gazillion other people who are dangerous out there does something. Um, he's got to get over that politics, get over the Rahm Emanuel problem that he feels that you know, the only people who care about this are the people who are already going to vote for Obama, and just do the right thing. This is becoming a legacy issue, and I hope Obama doesn't leave office with the same Guantanamo that he inherited from Bush. And, and you will notice that in the past few months, he has whittled away at that forever detainee category very quietly without anyone noticing. A few of the people that have been released, cleared for release, have been on that forever detention yeah. list and cleared. Well, I mean, frankly, so the five Taliban released five. were not insignificant people. Right. Exactly. You know, and if they can go, I mean, who there poses a more significant risk than these Taliban leaders? And you know, the, the, the security constraints on them are one year in Qatar. You know, so it's not as if this is a long-term solution. At some point, you've just got to learn to live with risk. Um, and, and if that's the price to get rid of this scar on America's reputation and, and bring U.S. detention policy within the law, I think that's a risk that we should assume. 
So uh, I think we have some answers to our questions, which is that the conversation over liberty and security has advanced somewhat more than I had thought before the beginning of this mm -hmm. conversation. It seems that we're rolling back certain things, sticking with certain things, but beginning to see what are gray areas and what are really black and white areas. So thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.